how do financial professionals create more trust with financial clients, maybe even in a digital meeting like through a webcam? Well, hello and welcome to Create Digital Trust with Financial Clients. My name is Roger Corville and welcome to another episode of V2's Thought Leader Conversation Series, sponsored by the crew at Virtual Venues, the team with a whole lot of experience production around virtual and hybrid events. But today's not about us, and I'm super pleased to have with me and us someone that I've known for a good long time in a shared professional community at National Speakers Association. Speaker, consultant, creator, Sherry Fitz, who has legit cred in digital and marketing and financial, most of all, paper girl of the year in 1976. (laughs) Welcome, Sherry. (laughs) You know, that kind of makes people get a clear idea of Paper Girl of the Year in 1976. It's like, wow. Um, Roger, it is so, first off, I am filled with delight at hearing your voice and um, being able to hang out with you. It just fills me with delight. My heart is singing right now. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful Mutual. I, well, one, it's been a while, and I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about what you've got cooking. But also, just in prep, I spent a little time catching the, the latest version of Sherry on your website. And I'm excited for whoever's listening, because, I mean, I know some of your background, obviously, that we didn't talk about. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just excited for what you might bring to the table. So, Maybe even just fill in a gap or two there in terms of the bio. Tell us who you are and what you do. <laughs> oh, you mean since 1976? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> there was this one time at band camp. <laughs> exactly. I've been in the world of financial services lately, what I've been saying, for half my life. And then I just let that pause be for a while. People start doing the calculations. And, you know, so I have. I've been in the world of financial services for half my life. And, um, And, you know, I started in this industry leaning into digital as a graphic designer. It was when the world of graphic design was coming into PageMaker and I had PageMaker 1.0. So I was, I was already leaning into digital. My dad was a computer programmer and I think that's partly his fault. He was also actually in Toastmasters and very involved in that and took me to Toastmasters when I was in eighth grade. So you put those two things together and you end up with me for sure. So I've been in the world of the 401k for quite some time. And so I'm very fascinated about the idea of behavioral economics and decision making and how people make decisions with money. And that's just kind of led to me continuing to lean into digital. I started an email newsletter back in 1998 when email platforms barely existed, like MailChimp. They probably weren't even, the people who started it probably weren't even born yet, <laughs> right? So, so I've, been, I've been in this industry a while and I was in corporate America. I had, a, actually I had a, great job you know i would you know it's one of those things where good enough gets in the way of great and so 10 years ago i started my own firm and it was a creative services firm and probably what you saw on my website is a new evolution of me being me you know and being calling myself a speaker calling myself a creator which i am down to my toes and really looking out honoring my value that I bring to this marketplace that I love so much. So, so that's kind of the short version. I've leaned into digital. I've leaned into decision-making. I'm interested in the emotional component. And then I'm kind of woo woo, you know, I'm wearing turquoise and tattoos and pierced nose and stuff like that too. Right. Talking about your big dog. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Subscribe to your newsletter. True, true story. (laughs) But, you know, I love that, and I think that's one of the things that I'm excited about for our conversation today. My parallel path ended up in this industry in 1999, and I started buying books. I bought literally every book but one, won't go into that story, on how to do seminars. And, of course, nothing was digital, and I, of course, wrote one of the very first books on virtual You wrote the book on that, Roger. You wrote the book. 
Um, you paved you paved a way for so many people with the work that you did. I just yeah, but this isn't about me. That. I know, but, <laughs> but I, I haven't talked to you we, for a while, so there's that. <laughs> there's where we touch down, which is how do we take what we do and think about the nature of how the medium transforms it, right? And we'll get around to talking about your digital EQ stuff and how you help people even work with cameras or, or and those that kind of thing. But maybe let's let's take a step back f- to the slightly bigger picture. So good. Because this has been true in financial services, but it's also been true with regard to just simply how people do meetings and events. And I've spent the last 23 years helping people go, ah, oh, we actually really can connect with people in a medium that doesn't include an actual handshake. So trust is this really big topic in the world of finance. And of course, it's been plummeting in categories like media and politics for for a good bit. But what's maybe the best place for financial folks to start? Maybe even thinking about trust. Yeah. Well, you know, the one thing that you said that I think is pretty fascinating, and I think about this all the time. If we if we rewind to where you and I were in 1998, 1999, one of the things that I saw was we took our concept of a newsletter, which we were used to having as a folded printed device, right? A 3D folded printed device. And then we just took it and put it onto the web as a folded 3D device. And people are like, ooh, pages flip, just like you're reading. And we're still doing that in a way. And so when you asked, you know, I don't remember exactly the words that you used, but when you ask, how does the media change the opportunity or whatever, I think what we end up doing is taking our version of the physical world, you know, and putting it into this digital world and not considering all of the things that this digital world has to offer that can amplify things so differently. Right. Um, So I guess that's probably where I would start, which is, you know, people say, well, I've got an online meeting, you know, they say virtual and in person. And I want to say everything is in person. You're there. I'm here. We're in person. Right. In fact, maybe the better distinction might be not on site versus online, but real time versus asynchronous. Oh, synchronous. I like that word. That's very Fancy. See, you're a pro in this area. I gotta like adopt some of those words. I just well, I'm a, I mean, I'm this a is hack. my world. I can get <laughs> ugly academic on you know, on all this stuff too, but that's just my geeky geeky approach. Yeah. But to your point, and I want to put an exclamation point behind that because literally in the in the in the academic world, there were two developments: medium theory of communication and transmission theory of communication, which began to look at how the medium affects how we how we connect and communicate. And that might be more obvious if we say, yeah, you can write a story in a book and you can write a story in a movie, but the, but the process of communicating that even to the same audience is very different. And that seems obvious, but to your point, and you nailed it, most of the time what we do is we bring what we already know and try to squeeze it in and then go, oh, it doesn't fit. Oh yeah, I don't like that digital stuff. Yeah. And, and socially, yeah. psychosocially, we notice what we lose before we notice what we gain. So, and that that's the point so that you good. made. Oh, yo, yeah. Oh. There's so many. Th- I, yeah, I lose this, but I gain <laughs> that. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about something lately, which is even the fact that people um, respond more from a fear of loss than, a, from, than the promise of a gain. It's something like 80% fear of loss versus a gain. And so when you're doing perhaps promotional copy and we're used to this, like we, we, we beat the drum of loss and I don't want to do that. Right. As an example, in the world of financial services, I say this all the time, cortisol stress never really motivated anyone, you know, to be their best self, but uh, we're going to have to go have some coffee and just, Uh, So I can just like write everything that you say so I can begin to understand some of those things. But how does it, you know, how does the world of financial services begin to look at this as frankly an opportunity? Right. 
Yeah, because the idea of trust is not a new idea in financial services. No. The, 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 the passed down from on high way of doing it is you got to spend more time pressing the flesh at the country club or, <laughs> or, or mm-hmm. whatever version that grandpa, you know, whatever way grandpa used to do it. Well, and it, there's a lot of stuff happening in my world of the 401k right now. And they say that there's an opportunity to serve. The numbers are crazy, but we'll just say more than 15 million Americans who are currently not being served by a 401k plan because of some recent legislation. And, you know, and there are, you know, these are all in the world of 401k plans, startup plans. So what does that mean? That means a, a, a device that has no money in it. So who would want to work with that anyway? We'll set that particular one aside. But what I think is I see opportunity. I see some advisors willing to lean into this digital thing, willing to create community, willing to go, all right, we're going to help these people. And it will create a virtual, you know, virtuous circle of um, them helping people and, you know, and um, capturing huge market share, if you ask me. Keep going. Oh, golly. I you know what? Here's a, here's a line that I pulled from one of your blog post titles. There are no marketing hacks. There and are I know no that you're hacks. getting ready. In fact, today, as we're recording this, you're getting ready to, to eat your own cooking, launch a community. Mm-hmm. Talk about a little more of that because community, by definition, is relational. Yeah. yeah um, so, so, as an example... I can't write a short email, Roger. I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> my emails are always very long. There's always a story. There always is. There's always, I always have to, I feel like what I need to do, especially in the world of financial services, when I'm three to five years ahead of most of my peers, I have to create some context. How do I do that? I do that with story. Just that's how I do that, how I set up some context about how I get here, a la what I'm doing right now. And so, I'm doing this very long email to introduce a community that I'm calling Sway to help people elevate their influence. There's a lot of stuff going on in my head about what's going to work and what's not going to work and what everybody should tell you about attention span and everything else. And I have to set that aside and, and do what I can to have a real conversation with a person on the other side of an email. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so um, my coaches tell me this all the time, which is that energy precedes outcomes, that the energy from which you create guides and determines the outcomes. That's, a, that's the woo-woo way of saying, consider that there is a human on the other side of your communication and there's no hack to that. Right. I am not doing clickbait. I, I try to optimize my subject lines I absolutely do, but well, right. But you just described to me the the words that I would use is the difference between relational and transactional, right? Oh, because oh, yep. I can't. I mean, at some point, a relationship, and I don't care if it's a marriage or a client. At some point, it's got to have a connection beyond the transaction because if it's transactional, the 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 speed with which you can transact them into being a client is the very same speed that someone else can transact them away from being a client as opposed to going, well, no, wait, 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 wait. I do business with Sherry, right? Sherry's got my back. Sherry tells funny stories about her big dog. Mm -hmm. By the way, just so referencing this big dog so everybody knows, he's 160 pounds. He is a tank. And, And some of that's from Cheesecake and my Italian husband feeding him three meals a day plus his regular kibbles i swear his name is fezig so where does fezig come from roger do you know I, my brain was just spinning on that and i i don't remember okay i'm gonna give you some i'm gonna give you some tips okay as as you wish as, as you wish as you wish is that a movie re- reference okay rodents of unusual size oh well there you go shot here in oregon even 
My my name is Inigo I... Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <sighs> Mowage. Wow, it's what brings us together today. Yeah, yeah you He's, know, I'm not so great with movie <laughs> references, but that is a classic. I mean, I can tell you who played lead guitar on Juan Might Get Charged and Only Weeps, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I love the one um, of Prince on that, oh, playing yes. that Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Makes me weep. Makes me weep, 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 weep. Anyway, just for those who don't know all of those references, that's from The Princess Bride. I would say one of the best movies ever made. And my dog is named after a character played by Andre the Giant. So he's a giant in the movie and his name is Fezzik. I so actually you. haven't watched that for a good long time. But so as long good. as we're as long as we're providing footnotes, uh, if you haven't seen the just go to YouTube and and Google while my guitar gently weeps with Prince. And it's the whole super band, you know, uh, mm -hmm. from um, George Harrison's kid, Donnie, to um, to Prince coming out and just killing it with the, the oh. final lead guitar solo. Jeff Lynn, um, oh. Tom Petty, all in the oh. super band. Yeah, it was amazing. All the, all the boys. I mean, it's just is, it is. And he's wearing a beautiful red outfit for sure. He's got a red hat on. He's just being Prince. He's just, it's amazing. It breaks my heart. Okay, so where were we? Back to um, the dog reference. I, I also, I mean, I know it's crazy, but he's a big part of my life. I walk every day um, up and over an extinct volcano here in Portland called Mount Tabor. And, and he gets to be off leash because I don't have anything in my ears. I use it as time for meditation and we have a great trusting relationship. And he means an awful lot to me. I've had dogs my whole life. My paper route money, 1976, bought me my first dog. So it's a big part of who I am. He's also, though, a great metaphor for stuff. So I tell people all the time, because advisors um, usually say one of two things, but compliance or I can't write. And somebody said something yesterday that I really loved that I heard, which was compliance is the government's lowest common denominator for our industry. Mm. Ding, 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 ding. So good. Because if you think about it, it's like, oh, I'm compliance is the government's lowest common denominator for our industry. That's the bar. That's the, that's and so, so that's the first thing. Then the second thing is I can't write. And what I say is, the minute you begin creating content, content finds you. You start to see metaphors all over the place and it makes it easier. Plus then bringing you into my life, um, you know, it's a way for you to see what kind of person I am and what I value and what I find important. And so I choose to share that as opposed to just trying to be a marketing hack to get you to click on something and spend some money. Right. My version of an illustration like what you just shared is, is going, you know what? You can open up the phone book <laughs> and find dozens of people who have the technical credentials to fix your teeth. Who do you go back to? Right. Yeah. You, someone with the bedside manner or they tell a funny story. I literally went to a dentist one time who used to go on cruises with heavy metal bands like Slipknot. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so, but I think that's something that fair to say people in financial services understand instinctively, because if you're dialing for dollars or however you're developing relationship at some point, the, the way that you connect with someone is around the stories that are naturally coming out of your mouth, not, I mean, your opening salvo isn't, Hey, well, I got my series 69 or, or whatever cred <laughs> it is that, so that right. Exactly. right. At some point exactly. it's, it's that, it's that level of, Oh, do I know who you are? Mm. And that trust, that's Roger. trust. Like that's, that's it. And I think that when we all first start out, we have to go everywhere 
to, you know, to begin to feed ourselves and get the flywheel of our business going. I acknowledge that. And as we go along, though, I think part of our own growth is beginning to determine who our people are. And you, I don't know if you see the sign um, much, Roger, but when you're when you're over in downtown Portland, you're on Burnside and you're coming east on the right hand side is my favorite sign ever. And it says long live the misfits, wild cards and dabblers. And I actually say those are my people. Those are my people. I love that sign. And I have yeah. got to get a photo shoot in front of it because I use those terms all the time. But what I'm doing is I'm actually claiming the misfits as mine, which we could get into that. But that's also my name, right? I'm a misfit and I have been a misfit. And, um, and you know, when you look at research around, like we just take the section of wealth management advisors and you look at research around how many clients can an advisor really service? Right. And if you want to really service the daylights out of your clients, many people say, Michael Kitsis, Bill Backrack, well, whatever, all these very smart people say, you can pretty much only have 50 clients. And when you think at how you could really create a deep relationship of trust and um, I don't want to say sanctity or whatever it is, with 50 people, then finding those right 50 people are crucial. And finding your people. So, you know, as you go along and at first you got to do everybody and then you just need to start going, you, you know, kind of recentering back, recentering back, recentering back. And when you get to finding your people, um, then that's when this, you know, particularly digital delivered via email or social or whatever it is, then that's, um, you know, how you can show up. One of the ways you can show up for them, for sure. So you, you bring up a good point. Um, I think of it in terms tell my, of like, tell my husband, <laughs> she's brilliant. You can excerpt that little sound. Yeah. Excerpt that little sound clip. Brilliant. Sherry Fitz is brilliant. brilliant. I think brilliant. of it in terms of concentric circles, right? In the most inner circle is my significant other. And they got a next kind of concentric circle with a couple of best friends that I've been friends with for 20 years. Right. And to your point, how many people are you going to really service? Well, let's call it 50. Well, you know, a lot more than that. Right. And at some point, how do you think about using digital communication to kind of balance that? Right. Cause I mean, at some point to your point, you begin, you're dialing for daughter dollars, you're, you know, spray and pray, whatever, whatever your marketing tactic is. And at some point you start culling it down and you go, and these are the deep ones. And then you need enough at the top of the funnel to, to be basically replace them as they fall out due to, you know, due to, uh, acquisition end of life or acquisition or right. Right. Um, the nasty divorce or, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. How do you, how do you approach call it synchronous versus asynchronous? How many times do you say, okay, here's how you need to be in person sometimes, but there's a whole lot of times you can turn on a webcam and make a really personal connection that doesn't mean getting on an airplane or even spending an hour to drive across town to get to the place you're going to have lunch. And then you've got, how do you communicate more broadly with those that you don't, can't spend as much time with? Is there a way that you approach kind of like those, I don't know, concentric circles of differing levels of depth? You know, the, the, here's the interesting thing. Of course, there's a story here, right? Of course. In there, in, in that, uh, over the, over the past couple of days, I got to spend some time in a retreat that a girlfriend did running the retreat from Paris. She was in Paris. She ran the retreat. We were all on the States. She was in Paris. It was amazing. And, and she asked us to make, um, uh, as you know, start to think about making a vision board. I haven't made a vision board in a very long time. It's right over there. In fact, so, so, and, and one of the things that she had us do was 
indicate of the six pillars that she thinks are part of a full and rich life, you know, what do we want in each one of those pillars? And those are health and wellness, um, relationships and community, home and environment, spirit, legacy, work and career. Now I was laughing my ass off because I said, oh, you mean it's just not work and career? <laughs> Right. Except for that, it dawned on me. And, you know, even before COVID, when I would be home here in Portland and, and there are times when I travel, travel, travel as a speaker and, you know, it's it, it, it's starting to heat up again for February and March and, you know, into April for spring conferences and whatnot. When I come home, I do. I want to just walk on my mountain with my dog and eat my husband's fresh made scones. And then sometimes I forget that I have community here. That I that there are people who I long to see here. I'm having lunch with Rob tomorrow, Robert tomorrow. Um, I'm super excited. But uh, so I, I, it was a really good exercise for me to look at as it related to effort um, to see friends and community and nurture that community because I spend an awful lot of time nurturing this community, and that's only part of who I am. Nonetheless. Um, you know, I kind of see it this way as I'm structuring my business, there's, there's, um, I am willing to have anybody and who wants <clears throat> consume my content, um, on social media or on my email, you know, that's kind of anybody. Right. And then, and then the the more that i ask of myself to give you the f the fewer people i can do that for you know like really do that for right and so right so what i'm doing is as an example i'm launching a community and it does not escape me that that's going to ask something new of me and i'll be serving people at a at a more affordable price point where I can, my hope is to be able to serve 100, 200, 1,000 misfits across our industry um, to help give them a voice because um, I think their voice matters. So, but that I, but I'm doing that in a way where I'm doing one to many, you know, one to many. And so when I think about how an advisor might structure their practice or, you know, or any professional um, thinking about what is the, what is your value curve, if you will, how can you help the maximum amount of people? And then frankly, and this sounds kind of interesting, but the closer that they get to you, the more time is required of you. And therefore there's an exchange of energy called money. Um, you know, to help you um, offer those services deeply and thoughtfully and all of those kind of things. So digital all along the way, and I would imagine, Roger, that you, um, you've you explored ways to bring digital to the conversation that I haven't even, like, Well, considered. it's mutual. That's the power yeah. of conversation. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, uh, there's a, there's a resource that allows you to do, have people fill out a form by, instead of having the words come up, you get to do a video of yourself helping lead them through the form. I'm super excited to see how that works. Nice. Right. Uh, yeah. Before I forget. Yes. Uh, will your community be able to be found at sherryfits.com or it will. how yeah, are people going to get in touch? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not up there on my website right now, but a couple of things. One, I'm doing a soft launch. Restaurants do that all the time. Oh, totally. <laughs> right. And patrons that go into a restaurant that has a soft launch understand there might be some hiccups. So um, I'm doing some soft launches. Once I get all the kind of, you know, the other part of this is thinking through all the waves, all the interactions, all the all the ways that I can make this a delightful digital experience. I'm holding the bar high for myself. Um, and that's the other thing it, is that 
And I'm so glad that you say that you read my newsletter and you, you know, you, you know, you, you understand the pictures of my furry dogs getting his toenail clipped, but you know, my hope is that when people open my newsletter, they feel a little rush of dopamine, right? That they, you know, that, oh, here comes Sherry, you know, um, there's an individual in our industry, um, Beth Z, the dirty best friend, mm -hmm. where I love getting her newsletter. I just love it because it's packed with geeky technical stuff I never knew. Yep. And it's just phenomenal. And so personality I with hold, a capital P. I and I hold myself. That's the you know, that's like in in my mind, I want to get to being as good and as consistent as Miss Beth Z. You know, um, and I want people to feel like I feel when I get our newsletter. I'm right. rambling. Uh, you know who else does that for me is Ann Handley. Oh, oh, golly. Only every oh, other indeed. weekend. But it, I mean, uh, there's not that many people. It's yeah. kind of like finding your favorite podcast and it's finding your people, right? To your mm -hmm. point about, about, you know, I think of it almost like some of your community, these concentric circles, like people self-selecting in, right? I Because sometimes people go, oh, you know, well, that's a lot of money. I'm like, well, it's not for the right person. <laughs> Yeah, you don't have to hire well, me, <laughs> or or yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you don't if you don't think it's a good deal, then you're not okay. my client. <laughs> yeah, you're not my person. You know, um, the one thing that you know, we're in the world of National Speakers Association, Association, and there's a gentleman there. His name is Bill Bacharach, and he's been working in our industry for a long time. And it's where the speaking industry intersects with financial services. And so he's been doing it a lot and his clients are financial advisors. And the one thing I got to see him speak yesterday and he just is generously pouring out his whole business model, giving a check sheet and everything. He's just like really the spirit of um, generosity. And also what I noticed was he was very clear on the value that he provides. And so, you know, to your point, Roger, which is when somebody says that's too expensive. Compared I always to, figure there's two sides to the coin. One. Yeah. What do I need to learn? Have I not been clear in, in positioning and, you know, under, helping them understand the value, but sometimes people don't get it. I'll, I'll use this as an illustration, not as a sales pitch, but you know, we're in the virtual event production business and have been since literally 1999. And, and over time, labor gets more expensive, technology gets cheaper, right? I mean, when we started, we built registration pages by hand in HTML email, <laughs> HTML, and then would push out literally confirmation and reminder emails manually, right? Well, now yeah, you can uh -huh. subscribe to GoTo or Zoom or something for 50 bucks a month, and it'll just, it just takes all the, a lot of labor out of the thing. But when people come and go, oh, well, why would I pay you X mm. to help me produce my three-day conference or whatever? Mm. What it tells me is you've never done it or you haven't mm. done it very much or you've only ever done it one way and you don't, right? And the, because the, the impact and the place where we create value is taking crap off your plate in the same way that Jiffy Lube does, right? It's not that you can't change right. your own oil. It's that they have all the stuff. They attack it with a team of people and you're out of there in 10, you know, in 10 minutes for 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. Or you could mess around with it for two hours, have to decide what you're going to do with five quarts of oil, which, by the way, it's not okay to pour it in the creek in the backyard. Or right? you, it's, right. it's just a, it's a simple and interestingly, what that has led to for us, one tends to be very long term clients, often in the financial services mm -hmm. industry who just see us as an extension of the team. But more importantly, it tends to help helped us realize who our clients are, which are those who mm -hmm. didn't just start this whole webinar thing. Right. They're doing yeah. a webinar a week, a webinar a month or got doing projects. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's a lot of work. And having somebody detailed that I can throw that over the fence to and who attacks it with a team of people or whatever. Right. Well, so, well, well if I may. And it's hard I to put all of that on a website. It's all sell relational. you sell your services, though. The other thing of it is, is. 
We go to experts because they're experts, people. We go to experts because they ask the questions that we don't know to ask. We go to experts to um, to help us um, live in our expertise. You, you know, I I uh, I'll give you an example that I think of an organization that needs your help. I was, and I won't use any names, but I was at a financial services conference last year. And it turns out this particular company is, it calls themselves a FinTech firm, okay? And they are there, I've always wondered what the heck, if energy precedes outcomes, when you start a conference, you don't have somebody walk up and go, all right, so the bathrooms are down the hall, Here's how you do this. That's not the energy you want to start a conference from, but that's, you know, that's also, I still don't understand that they don't understand that. Last year, understandably, one of their speakers, their opening speakers um, came down with COVID. And so what they decided to do was broadcast, um, you know, the speakers in to the meeting. And there I was at an opening session of a conference in a watching a YouTube video, awful, awful <laughs> Zoom conference. And I am like, what the heck, people? You call yourself a fintech firm. And my friend works there. And he said, well, we didn't know. And I said, you're a fintech firm. You should have. So this is what I'm saying. You should have those people on staff or you should know that you need to have somebody ready to go. And that would so be your organization. I mean, I, you know, I think of like, as an example, I say never zoom alone and I zoom alone a lot because I'm just a solo flyer. And nonetheless, when I make an investment to zoom alongside somebody who's producing the stuff for me, it's so much better. It's so much better. And now what we're doing is we're calling this thing a hybrid and the hybrid experience and having that's a, that's not one event. That's three events. That's the onsite. That's the synchronistic one. However you said it. And then, or, synchronize and then that's the one between the two together and doing that yourself if you so sorry i'm just selling you but doing that yourself you can't do that yourself yeah you don't know what you're doing you know how when you have been in, in an industry for a good long time you know the the the, the client better than they know themselves sometimes, right? And this is true for financial advisors. This is true for, for a lot of folks, right? I know the questions you should ask, but you haven't even thought yet to ask. What you yes. just described to me is, is the technology is part of the equation, but you're really describing a behavioral problem, right? You've got a people mm -hmm. problem. Speaker is out. The, the now we need someone else. What's the best way to do this? But at the end of the day, nobody wants to just sit in a room and watch a YouTube video together because at the end oh. of the day, there's some part of the experience and the experience isn't about, is, is this much about delivering the content and it's this much about connecting people. <laughs> and yeah, I, yeah. And I think that's, you know, like the lowest common denominator experience that we were, we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Just zooming in an alternative speaker, that's just table stakes. The question is, how do we have the audience still go, dang, that was awesome. I'm really glad I showed up. I'll see you next year. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to share their name with you later just so you, <laughs> you can. Oh, all good. No. And the goal here isn't to throw anybody under the bus, right? Well, I totally know. Yeah, exactly. But it also says that, you know, back to the, even the, um, the thing that we started this with, which is that you said something about the medium and the message or whatever it was, which is that we come to this space here with a 3D construct and it's not anymore. And we, um, 
So every, you know, every time, you know, I, I hold myself accountable to learn. That's one of my deep values is, you know, constant learning. And there's your rep, um, honoring this space and seeing that this digital space is an opportunity for you will craft an opportunity for you to kind of um, enhance relationships. Your the you know the experience that people have with you, if it's seamless, if it's real, regardless of whether you're in person or whether you're across a camera. Frankly, as an example, I feel like good audio is respectful. As an example, you know that the, the, this beginning to see it as an extension of who you are and how you bring value and really honoring it and not just doing good enough is right. what I see is people just doing good enough. They got to a certain place and they're good enough. And I, and I am saying and beating the drum. Oh, no, you're not good enough. No, you're not. You, 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 this, I, I did this um, quiz a couple weeks ago in a, in a webinar, a webinar, I hate that word, right? Because too. now people go, uh, 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 so I'll say a live event, <laughs> right? Or, or what, what words do you use for a webinar, Roger? Uh, either, well, I use webinar in my own stuff because it's yep. still the SEO. That's where you, I still get the SEO, right? For, for yep. the company. Yep. I yep. don't like it for exactly the reason that you just suggested, which is that people think they know what it is. And that's because most people do it really poorly, right? Mm -hmm. And probably my most frequent analogy is you don't open up Microsoft Word and think there's only one way to write. You could write a training manual and you could write a poem, right? We don't conflate the, the, the communication with the medium. And yet we think webinar is, oh, talk at people for 45 minutes and then take some questions at the end. Oh. So I tend to avoid that. Um, yeah. On site versus online, mm -hmm. live online, uh, mm -hmm. virtual, it kind of depends on the context of who I'm, who I'm speaking to, but yeah, I love avoiding the yep. word webinar. So I was doing a live lesson the other day and I asked people to grade themselves on the spectrum of beginner to, you know, beginning to mastery. And I had various things, you know, on a scale and I don't remember, I think it was a scale of seven or whatnot. And one of the people in the meeting gave himself a six, which would be expert. And I, <laughs> I was like, wow, that's, I'm pretty awesome. Very, Just ask me. <laughs> that's that's a, such a curious perception because when you come, when he, when he came, comes to the meeting, he's leaning back like this, his hands are on his belly. He, he has no green screen poor lighting and so he's got a holographic step and repeat logo in the background don't get me started on that i mean it's just like his audio is bad he does not look at the camera and i thought you say you're an expert and i and i said to myself well wow on the scale of you know one to seven i'm i'm thinking i'm somewhere around a four or a five meaning you know I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm advanced maybe, and but I am context. Yeah. You're teaching them camera skills in a virtual context, right? Yeah. Um, I'm teaching, I was teaching them about what it means to win in a sales conversation in a hybrid environment. Got it. Keep and going. So I was yeah. I was talking about mostly not necessarily the tools and the tech behind this exchange, but the, but the, um, how, you need to look at it as three different spaces. Uh, um, if you're going to try to do a hybrid sales environment, 
what do you, you know that you need to have a producer there and what does that mean and what's that person's role and how that's different and the different roles that people need to assume when producing a high stakes um, sales presentation and it's not just one person turning on zoom is pretty much what I was trying to kind of get them to understand that there are many things that come into bringing a well produced experience to the table. And again, this is what I say. And I said it before, there are going to be individuals that lean into this experience and hold themselves accountable to learn and be better and partner with people who can help them do that better. And it will have an impact on their sales numbers. It will, it is already is. Yeah. I think there is some nuance based on context that, that the right person or team can help with, right? There's a time to go spend a couple hundred grand on production. There's a time when you can get it done for 20 grand. There's a time when you can get it done for two grand. Let's just take our, just say our context here, mm -hmm. for instance, right? So you are, I, I know you help people with this kind of stuff, but uh, um, you're clearly using an SLR camera. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I simply know that because you've got the book effect, right? You're in focus in the front, in the, in the mm -hmm. foreground, and, you know, it's um, blurred out in the background. I'm using a Logitech Brio that cost me a couple hundred bucks because I'm in a temporary space. You can still mm -hmm. create space between you and what's behind you, which is why I do what I do and change the color, I guess, if, if you don't like that color. But... Ooh, I can change the color, too. <laughs> <laughs> But the, wow, I like that. That's better than mine. Um, part of one of the questions you've got to ask is, well, what is going to be the expectation of the person on the other side? Mm -hmm. you remember the old, and I don't even know if this is still true, but remember the old adage of like, when you're going to a client meeting, meet them where they're at in terms of dress and then go up one notch, right? Yeah. If they're going to be casual, maybe you don't show up wearing a tie, but maybe a jacket right. or, or right, yeah. whatever that little. And I think we can do that here, right? It's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, how do we get you to the next level? Or if your clients are going to be at level C, how do you get to level D or whatever that, whatever that is, you don't have to go drop 10 grand on a, on a, on, oh, on a space Rod, to be able to do something like that. But yeah. I can tell you that my Elgato key light airs, are mm -hmm. freaking money, right? I mean, those things are awesome because I can adjust them in real time when the light outside the window in front of me. Which but, one do you and, have? And I just, right. Well, this is actually not that. I'm noticing that there's a reflection on my glasses because the sun is now coming in. It's hitting the mirror in front of me and it's um, bouncing onto my glasses. And so I actually have all of my blinds on remote oh. control. Because controlling light is a big thing. And, you know, the sun is starting to shine in Portland, Oregon. Be careful, people. We're going to right. start wearing Tevas with socks pretty soon. Um, so, but I will say that I did 80 seminars, 80 virtual seminars in 2020 with a Logitech Brio, really good lighting a, and a really good, I, I had some podcasting gear, so I had a really good audio and a green screen. And I, I, pull that out every day. In fact, you, I mean, I can geek out about this camera thing. I hold, sometimes I think I hide behind my technology and my nerd. Um, and then sometimes this is just my hobby as an example, but that, that, you know, I, I pull that out again. And I've even thought about using it as a second camera, although I don't like my profile, but I think to your point, the tech, you know, the technology could could become a crutch and it's back to if we just even to set that aside and go right what's our intention what what do you want I, you do this as a speaker i when i am working on a presentation i do i stop and i learned this at nsa and i can't remember from who but i stop 
and I give blessings to the last person in the last row. And I think to myself, what do I want them to think and feel and more importantly do as a result of this conversation? And if I can get one person to do one thing, I believe I've been successful given all the things that we pile on people. And so, you know, I celebrate those, that tiny thing. That's the same thing for this environment. Right. What do I want people to think, feel, and do as a result of our time together? And so starting to your, you know, starting with what your intention is and what you want to build for that intention, you know, and, and it, yeah, it could be two grand and it could be 200 grand. And there are times for both, frankly, right? you know, there are times for both because what do you want people to think, feel, and do? And how many people are there? How many people are there? You know, I, right. You don't need to, to yeah. set, you're going to have a client meeting. You're going to fire up zoom FaceTime or whatever your thing is. Mm-hmm. Do you, I mean, I don't turn on the background or do throw up a green screen, my green screens in storage. Cause I, yeah, hate, I, I hate that stuff. Personally, I would just, <laughs> I would just rather be real and go, Hey, um, Have a clean I'm going to do something right. that yeah. just keeps me front and center. And, mm-hmm. but you know, to be fair, our clients tend to be mid and large B2B, right? Yep. Financial, mm-hmm. healthcare, legal, uh, fortune 500 kind of stuff. Reputation and, people. Yeah. Reputation. And there tends to be one yeah. of two categories, right? There's either the Uber high production because we're doing a virtual conference and the CEO is going to walk on stage and it's, and they got legit multi-camera crews and whatever or we get the vp of something doing something in their office and we're gonna say now just don't show up our goal here is to not have you just show up looking like every other virtual meeting that you've ever been in let's just Mm -hmm. tweak one thing we we literally call it plus one wherever you're at plus one as in how do we just do that one extra thing that helps help someone they may not even consciously know why you seem different and audio is a great example right most people go oh you got killer audio great so how do we help you get there you don't need the other thing. you don't need a thousand dollar microphone like i've got what you what we need but what we do need to do is get you away from just talking into your mac Ooh, yeah. Or, or, or the other, you know, the echo, the horrible echo. The other thing that you do, Roger, very well, that doesn't cost any money is that you use your voice as the instrument that it is. You, you, you modulate your voice. You, um, for me, what I find sometimes is I'm on a webinar and I tend to project all the time. And every once in a while, I just practically whisper. I work to modulate my voice mostly from a volume perspective and then from allowing some space perspective, but that's a plus one that everybody can do that helps the other person on the other end pay attention. And then there's the fabulous thing of, of, you know, um, what's it called? Pattern interruption. Right. So let's take that point. Yep. Mm-hmm. And turn it into as we kind of evolve toward our the end of our time together here. Let's turn exactly. that into a few tips that somebody yeah. listening can walk away with. And I'll share mm-hmm. I'll go first and we'll just trade back and forth okay. for a few. And it could okay. be by video or audio. Okay. One of the things that changes when we move from from on site to online is that we hear ourselves differently. And because we don't have that same sense of our audience, one thing that we do in person, maybe more naturally, that feels weird in this space is the pause. And when I do something like that, right, because you you pause in advance of dropping a key point, right, that pregnant pause, you drop in, you pause in front of making the key point to create anticipation, you pause after to let it sink in, right? It's part of how the brain processes. But that 
feels like it's a long time when you're not, when you're speaking and you're not hearing anything else. Exactly. Give yourself mm -hmm. permission to have that pause. No, I love me some pause. That's a very good one. That's a very good one. Uh, All right. Well, video I, or audio no. tip. Okay. Let's see here. Video. It's super hard. I got you. Cause my friend Roger is not what I'm looking at right now. My friend Roger is actually down over there to the left. But if I spent my whole time talking to him down over the, to the left, you wouldn't think I was talking to him. So we'd think you had a the, great looking forehead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my bangs and everything. But so there's power in eye contact. Mm -hmm. And I look down at him every once in a while so I can see his smile and hopefully kind of gauge things. But eye contact, eye contact, look at the camera please. Okay. I'll do one more. Then you do one more and we'll, uh, we'll get folks out of here. Cool. To me, if there is, and I lied, it's not going to be about video or audio, but it is going to be, I think about one of the most basic things that we can do when someone comes and says, you know, how do I do this? Or I don't like that virtual thing or something. I always begin by asking what they do in person. Hey, if you're standing on stage, how do you do? How do you get introduced? How do you walk up? Are handouts already on the tables or do you pass them out part of the way through the program or, or whatever that is? And one of the things that I ask people about is how do you connect or interact with people? And I think of that in terms of formal versus informal. Formal meaning I know that at this point in, in the presentation, I'm going to ask a question and expect a response. Informal is I'm barreling along and I see a hand go up. Well, how do you respond to that? Great. Do you expect them to sit there and hold up their hand for 30 minutes until you're all done with your presentation and then you take Q&A at the end? No, very few people, unless it's a TED Talk or a keynote, very few people, what do you do? You take the question and then you go, you answer it or you say, can I get back? That's a little off topic. Can we, can I get you at the break or can I, you know, I'm going to get to that in the next section. We'll, you know, sit tight. Well, why don't, if we connect with people that way when we're in person, why don't we do that online? And to me, one of the most basic things you can learn how to do is to use that digital body language to your digital EQ kind of thing and go, how do I keep an eye on my audience and how do I respond to them? And like, like I know they're actually there and that they typed something in and they go, Oh, Sherry, good point. I'm going to get to that in the next section. Keep rolling. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I like that question. I like that question an awful lot. Um, for me, I think, and I mentioned it just a tiny bit, but, but I'll do it again, just to be clear. There's something called pattern interrupt yes. and, and what pattern interrupt is, especially especially in the old school webinars where it was you show up the slides just go 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 and nothing happens what happens after 10 minutes of slides and go 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 your audience has lost track and i always say you're competing with the chicken recipe for dinner yep. so what you so what a pattern interrupt is i'm gonna plan in my pattern interrupts i'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to actually give my co-host permission to interrupt me. I'm going to have a different voice come in. I'm going to have something regardless of where, what, where it is, I'm going to do something to break up the monotony of my voice and my slides in order to help people have a little break in their brain and help them pay attention. Pattern interrupt, plan that in. If you're doing a 60 minute presentation, holy smokes, you've got to have six to seven to possibly eight of those planned into your presentation. And, you know, Roger, it could be answering questions and it's not saying any questions, any questions, right? right. But nonetheless, pattern interrupt, plan them in. You know, my favorite version of that, I tell people to go watch the number one TED talk ever, which is Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, called How Do Schools Kill Creativity? 
and he asks a question that he doesn't actually expect you to answer. He goes, am I right? Well, what do you think? Yes, no. Can you repeat the question? I didn't hear what you said, right? He, that it triggers the brain to your point about pattern interrupt, right? Neurolinguistic programming is a form of going, ah, something changed. He just asked me a question. It's, it's like almost an autonomic response. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a, there's a thousand ways you can do pattern interrupt and I'm going to put a big exclamation point on, on how brilliant you are. Sherry, tell us how to get in touch with you. This is so much fun. I'm coming back. Like just get, I'm going to like put in my, my calendar six months from now, I get to hang out with you again. Let's do you it. You can, you can, you can find me at sherryfits.com. Is F I two T's. F I two T's. Yes, exactly. Sherry, Sherry with an one I. R. Yeah, exactly. One R with one I. R. Yeah, exactly. Fits. It's all kind of combobulated, but yeah, that's where you can find me. It's awesome to spend some time with you and you know, Thank you for, um, you know, thank you for taking time out today. And well, I knew out. you had good stuff, particularly since we both share. Um, I'm going to use this term fairly broadly, but since we both share financial services as a key industry that we serve you exclusively and us, that's one of the main, one mm -hmm. of the main industries that we serve. I just figured that someone out there is interested in taking their game to the next level or, and, and you know, cause and I'm going to ask you in just one moment for your final thought. I think one of the beautiful things is that, and you alluded to this earlier, status quo isn't going to meet your goals. That's not going to, that's not going to, that's not going to help you get where you want to go. And yet you don't have to, you don't have to do much more than that plus one to be a standout from the whatever, and you can continually improve and, um, I'm really excited that you took a moment to share because I mean, gosh, your, your brain is so deep. I'm really glad you spent a little time with us sharing final thought, final thought. I think you should watch the best movie ever. I think you should watch princess bride. That's my final thought. You no know, one expects the Spanish inquisition. <laughs> Never trust a Sicilian when death is on the line. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That's my final thought. You know, this make room for play in conversation. Yeah, yeah that's a wonderful thing. Well, uh, again, SherryFitz.com, one R, one I, two T's. <laughs> and uh, really glad that you spent a little time with us. And um, I don't say that to our audience as well. Thank you. If you're still hanging out with us, I really appreciate you spending a little time uh, honoring us. We don't take that lightly that you pay with your attention and your time. And we, uh, we endeavor to deliver value.